Hello and welcome to the MS Dress, A Closer Look. My name's Katie and I work here at the MS Archive in Leeds. This photograph doesn't show the archive. This is the dress buying department in the late 1950s. If you're watching the premiere of this talk, I'll be here in the chat on the right hand side to answer any questions you might have. If you're watching it at another time, do get in touch with any questions. Our email address is company.archive at marksandspencer.com. A quick introduction. The MS Archive in Leeds holds over 72,000 objects telling the story of MS. That includes the business archive as well as lots of merchandise and products that have been sold at MS since 1884. Our exhibition is open to the public and free to visit from Monday to Friday. The M&S story began in 1884 when Michael Marx set up his first market stall on Leeds Kirgit Market. He was selling haberdashery and household essentials all priced at a penny. Ten years later he met Tom Spencer who bought a half share of the business in 1894. But it wasn't until the 1920s that we started selling clothing. So today we'll be looking in more detail at a garment that has evolved dramatically even throughout the 20th century. We'll take a look at some favourites from the archive collection, including intricately printed tea dresses of the 1930s and 40s, full skirted floral dresses in the 1950s, 1960s dresses that were described as well above the knee for the young go ahead, right up to today's archive inspired creations. We'll discover how MS has dressed women since 1926. Although we didn't start selling clothing until 1926, in the early days of the business, we sold accessories and haberdashery to help the home dressmaker make their own garments. The advert on the left is taken from a 1913 customer magazine and promotes a collar support. The advert refers to nasty red marks caused by the ordinary support. Ordinary support here likely meaning celluloid strips that were sewn into the fabric. These patented supports had a hidden roller to supposedly stop this chafing, although we've no evidence as to the effectiveness of them. On the right are just a few examples of haberdashery held in the archive. At a time when many women would have made their own dresses and repaired old dresses, these buttons, needles and thread would have been household essentials. Our drapery department opened in 1926. A wide range of clothing was introduced, including dresses, lingerie, men's and children's wear. Unfortunately, we don't hold any dresses from this time. However, a series of weekly bulletins in 1927 tell us about the variety of dresses on sale. These include print dresses, art silk dresses, satin frocks and embroidered royal frocks. In 1927, a supervisor, Mr. Jacobson, wrote to the bulletin to recommend that dresses should be sold from a larger counter as they were too cramped on the small counters. He said each end of the counter should be devoted to frocks 2 and 11 and 3 and 11, which acts as a means of attracting the crowds of women to the counter. To avoid missing any sales, it is necessary to have four assistants outside the counter and two inside. The outside assistants merely demonstrating and selling, leaving the inside assistants to do the wrapping up and taking the cash. He ends his report saying, I feel that a dress department given a good variety and satisfactory value bids fair to be one of our best seasonal departments. By 1936, we'd stopped selling haberdashery, making the move more fully towards ready to wear clothing. M&S recognised the importance of design in the 1930s and so we opened a design department in 1936, producing in-house designs rather than being presented with designs by suppliers. In 1938, we began buying printed fabric designs direct from Parisian designers. We said business can be very much stimulated by the introduction of really genuine designs produced by a Parisian artist. The range of dresses sold in the 1930s was huge. Stock control documents from the time show that we were selling dresses in artificial silk, taffeta, printed cotton, high neck, button front, petticoat style, dirndl style, marocaine, crepe, 
embroidered and wool, to name just a few. This photograph shows a window display and it's a range of beautiful printed dresses, some with contrast collars and tie necks, all from the fashion for the fuller figure range. Our clothing ranges expanded in the 1930s, as did the way we advertised them. The Marks and Spencer magazine was a customer magazine published in 1932. It gave customers information on new products through aspirational colour adverts like this one, as well as stories, letters, competitions and recipes. Most dresses that we sold at this time were made from either artificial silk, which was rayon, wool or cotton. This advert from 1932 shows party dresses in artificial silk, artificial suede and all wool. Now, unfortunately, we don't hold any 1930s dresses in the archive collection, so I'm going to cheat a little now. And for our first archive garment, I'm going to share this garment instead. Here we have a wonderful pair of beach pyjamas from the m and archive collection. And I know it's not a dress, but um, as I mentioned, we, ha we haven't got any 1930s dresses currently in the collection. Beach pyjamas, as they were known, first surfaced in the late 1920s and they were originally intended to be worn over swimsuits on the beach. Alongside autumn, winter and spring, summer, resort wear became a third season and often included garments specifically designed for holidays and trips to the coast. As well as beach pyjamas, we sold beach skirts and even woolen beach shirts. Pajama suits for loungewear were popularised in the 1920s by designers such as Chanel and Viennet, and by the 1930s they were being worn out of the bedroom. In 1931, Vogue magazine declared, a woman may and does wear pyjamas to quite formal dinners in her own house, to other people's dinners in town and country if you know them well, and the more iconoclastic members of the female sex even wear them to the theatre. The print on these St Michael beach pyjamas is very typical of the 1930s and that green and orange combination is often seen in 1930s textiles and interiors as well as clothing. Into the 1940s now and clothing rationing was introduced in June 1941. Each garment was given a coupon value depending on the quantity of cloth or yarn used. The scheme addressed shortages and prevented panic buying. It also slowed production. Lots of the textile workforce have been called up to the military and factories have been requisitioned by the government. 11 coupons were needed for a dress. Two were needed for a pair of stockings. There were issues with rationing. Money was still needed to buy clothing. All dresses, for example, had the same points value regardless of quality. Wealthier shoppers could afford to buy robust clothes which would last while the less well-off had to use the same number of coupons for a cheaper garment that might wear out in half the time. Regulations were needed to keep clothing to a minimum standard. m and worked with the Board of Trade to implement minimum quality standards. Together they developed the utility scheme. The scheme was designed to standardise production of textiles, control prices and ensure minimum quality standards. Around the same time that the utility scheme was introduced, austerity measures were put in place to conserve supplies of yarn and cloth. The amount of fabric used in garments was restricted. For example, a maximum of five buttons and two pockets per garment were allowed at one point. As the fabric we used was restricted, we invested in print design, elevating these basic rayons, cottons and linens with bright, beautiful prints. These dresses held in the archive collection are both fantastic examples of the beautiful prints used on utility garments. Many people think of utility clothing as being quite grey or drab, but it was often anything but. For many women, fashion and what they wore was the one thing they could control, and bright, cheerful clothing was promoted as morale boosting. Austerity measures were more relaxed towards the end of the 1940s and so a lot of the garments we have in the collection are still made under the utility scheme but have more detail or use more fabric than would previously be allowed. These two garments are also held in the archive collection and have beautiful details such as the little collars 
uh, and again feature fantastic prints. Another wonderful example from the archive collection is this uh, utility dress. The bright pink really stands out, really elevates this kind of standard cloth and would have made this a really eye-catching dress in store. We cut down our range of garments sold in store during the war. Ranges were condensed and tended to be based on more classical or popular styles. In 1941, for example, two price ranges for dresses were introduced, eight shillings in 11 and 15 shillings, moving away from a previously confusing pricing policy. We found that customers actually wanted to purchase dresses at the higher price. It was seen as better quality and therefore would last longer. However, customers were anxious that their new purchase wouldn't fit. This was, of course, in the days before changing rooms. Our refund policy helped reassure customers if it didn't fit, they could just bring it back the next day and exchange it. The utility scheme ended in 1952. M&S carried lessons learned forward, especially regarding print and technology and research into synthetic fabrics. M&S took developments in textile technology made during the war and used them to provide easy care, easy wear, more hard wearing garments in synthetic fabrics with the aim of easing the housewife's daily burden. Simon Marx saw that class divisions had blurred, women had become more independent and would demand clothes that were classless. It would have been impossible to provide these garments at a price most women could pay without the introduction of synthetic fabrics. And so in the 50s, the quality and range of goods increased, new and better quality materials were within reach and new fashions were embraced. By 1952, the shop floor was full of flared skirts as a backlash against the previous decade's rationing. And heavily influenced by the shapes introduced by Christian Dior at the end of the 1940s, the full skirted nipped in waist style that would become known as the new look. At the forefront of this transformation was a fabric known as Marspun. Originally, this was a spun rayon produced under the utility schedule, simply known as 1005. But by 1953, it had been developed, rebranded and renamed to make it more attractive to customers. And here's a striking example of a Marspun dress held in the collection. It's got this lovely wide shawl collar detail. And the print on this dress is particularly interesting. You can imagine the print designer actually creating those marks with different shades of blue paint. And three more examples of Marspun dresses from the archive collection. This fabric was colour fast, shrink resistant and easy to wash and iron. All qualities that post-war customers would have welcomed. By 1955, 3,000 different Marspun dresses were available with the tagline, Marspun makes sense. We said, this enormous selection is produced by various combinations and permutations in design, style and colour. New wonder fabrics continued to change the shape of 1950s fashion. During the war, all supplies of nylon had been directed towards the military. Following the war, retailers and manufacturers were able to make use of this versatile fabric. We started using nylon at the end of the 1940s, and by the mid 1950s, it was seen as a perfect fabric for dresses. In 1955, we developed a new process which gave nylon the crisp feel of cotton, and you can't see through it, yet it's uncrushable. This new line of nylon dresses was called Meteor in typical 1950s style. The archive holds some of these 1950s nylon dresses. The fabric is definitely of its time. Nylon garments though were popular with customers. There was no need for ironing and they were very quick drying. I want to show you a short film now. And although synthetic fabrics were the big story in the 1950s, customers were still keen to buy natural fabrics and crisp cotton dresses were in demand. This tea advert, TV advert, which was shown in 1960, promotes cotton dresses for summer. The original is 15 minutes long, but I've taken a two minute clip. Over 4 million people saw the advert when it was aired. It was m &S's largest and most ambitious use of TV so far.
the girls who work at Marks and Spencer know better than anyone the value of the goods they sell. Here are eight of them. Do they serve you sometimes? Gloria Mears from Croydon, Maria Carper from Aylesbury, and Linda Paris from Bromley have all chosen St. Michael blouses and skirts. Gloria's blouse is lace-trimmed cotton, and its frosty whiteness is exactly right with her crisp navy and white skirt. It's just one of the many patterns you can find at 29 and 11. Maria's parchment poplin blouse picks up exactly the tone of the pocket trimming on her skirt of coffee-coloured sailcloth and the gingham top that Linda is wearing can be bought on its own. But look how well it teems with the gingham binding on her deep blue skirt. A pretty summer outfit for less than 50 shillings. Now you'll find Shirley Grant at the Edmonton Marks. She picked out this good-looking slim dress with a print of dark brown on white. The skirt is fully lined. Joan Cockshot and Sheila Mackinder come from the north. Joan works in the Bradford store, Sheila at Leeds and they love the full-skirted cottons you can wear from midday to midnight, as right for shopping in the high street as for dancing on the pier. Maureen Solomon sells skirts at Marks & Spencer in Richmond. She likes prints too, this time a white coin spot on sapphire blue. Every full-skirted dress has its own stiff petticoat built in, and not one of these lovely dresses would cost you more than 69 and 11. Now, if you're in the Bromley store tomorrow, then maybe you'll see Barbara Baker. Off duty, here she chooses a slim dress in cotton satin with a rose print. You can only buy St. Michael cottons at Marks and Spencer. Young women go there because they love the up-to-the-minute designs and the bright, gay colours. But to show you that a well-cut dress is more important than hip measurements, here is Doris, wearing a classic shirt waster, size 42. Into the 1960s now. The design department were looking at who was shopping at M&S and new potential customer audiences. We saw our customers reading more magazines, watching television and travelling more. We believed the transference of new style ideas had to be faster. We said the wish to be tempted has accelerated and so we needed to satisfy this demand. We saw a lot more women were entering the world of work in the 1960s, particularly going into office jobs. We catered for this by selling ranges of smartly tailored skirt suits with accessories to complete the perfect office look. Some examples on the left hand side for marketing in 1962 and 1967. And on the right hand side, we have a couple of examples of smart skirt suits in jersey wear and tweed that would have been sold at Marks and Spencer in the 1960s. Our designers were also creating ranges aimed at younger people. We had sold a few styles for teenagers in the mid 1950s when there was generally less distinction between teenagers and adults clothing. In response to the growing youth culture in the 1960s, these ranges became more distinct from the children's and adults ranges. Developments in synthetic fibres meant that garments could be produced cheaply and therefore be more affordable to a younger market. On the left, we have young fashions from 1962. We said, the young fashion range is really with it, like crazy man. A range called Younger Look in 1966 boasted of lifted hems, and we said, we actually show the knee. These styles were described as an intelligent interpretation of the current op fashion. The middle image here shows the Junior Miss range of 1968 and on the right is a leaflet for Young St Michael launched at the end of the 1960s. In the 1960s, our design department was more outward looking than in previous years and they were finding inspiration in a wider range of places. The head of our design department, Hans Schneider, travelled to shows in Paris, watching Balenciaga describing him as the leader in the great classic tradition. He went to Yves Saint Laurent shows for the boutique trends. According to Prudence Glynn, fashion editor at the Times, m and designs bought from Dior or inspired by Balenciaga cost shillings, yet retained that certain quelque shows that cost so many pounds in the Avenue Montaigne. The photograph on the left shows designers at work in 1963 at head office 
And on the right, we can see an M&S fashion show showing Space Age fashions from 1968. I'd like to share another advert with you now. Full Max was shown in cinemas in 1962 and promotes women's wear in Tricel. Tricel was a silky fabric, making it perfect for dresses, but with the benefit that it didn't need ironing. Full marks to our three smart girls travelling in Tricel. Their mothers are in Tricel too. St Michael Tricel from Marks and Spencer. Travel smart in Tricel foulard dresses. So many colourful prints and styles at your Marks and Spencer. Arrive so fresh. St. Michael Tricell shrugs off creases. A quick change to Tricell jersey. St. Michael Tricell laughs at packing. Yes, the blouses too are in Tricell. Catch every eye in St. Michael Tricell suits with the look and feel of silk. So smart, so reasonable from your Marks and Spencer. Stay fresh and crisp in Tricell jersey. Permanently pleated, so easy to wash, so quick to dry. Look fabulous in St. Michael Tricell skirts and blouses. You'll find brilliant colours and so many styles in your Marks and Spencer. Dance pretty in St. Michael Tricell dresses. They're lovely, elegant. Fashion loves Tricell. There's so much that's new in St. Michael Tricell. They cost so little at your Marks and Spencer. Into the 1970s, the main issue dominating women's wear seems to be skirt or dress length. There was much conversation and conflicting opinion on the ideal skirt length. In a 1970 article in our staff magazine, we wrote, opinion concerning the length of women's skirts is divided. A quick glance down the high street reveals every length from floor to mid thigh and for the first time in the history of womankind, there is no definite line where the skirts of all fashion conscious women must end. These marketing images showing varying lengths of skirts and dresses date from 1972, 1977 and 1976. The incredible kaftan dress on the right hand side, uh, we actually hold a version of this in the archive collection as well and it is as incredible in real life. We'll have a look at some examples in the collection now which cover the range of 1970s skirt lengths. So this shorter length dress was sold in 1972 and it's made of that most 70s of fabrics, crimpline. It, that meant it would have been very easy to wash, it wouldn't have needed ironing. The dress has been in the archive collection for many years and we don't have any information on the donor. The dress has a few tiny burn marks, likely from the wearer's cigarette. Little signs like this link the piece back to the original wearer and remind us that the dress would have been worn and enjoyed and wasn't always in a museum. This bold print nylon midi dress dates to around 1974. It has a zip front fastening below this oversized collar. The print on the dress is interesting. It resembles a traditional woven fabric, perhaps with a South American influence, although the colours are far from traditional. And this tiered maxi dress was sold in 1975. Longer length dresses throughout the decade were a good example of the cyclical fashions and the influence of previous decades on the trends of the 1970s. 
For example, the 1972 television adaptation of War and Peace has been credited with a rise in popularity of full-length Empire Line dresses. The influence of these early 18th century neoclassic styles can be seen in this dress, with its square neckline, tiered skirt and short sleeves. The dress also shows the influence of the hippie movement of the 1960s, filtered down for the high street and for m and customers into the 1970s. In the 1980s, we start to see the influence of popular TV shows like Dallas and Dynasty. Millions around the world watched these fantasies of wealthy American lifestyles, and many of the fashions were adapted for the high street. We start to see padded shoulders, boxy jackets, shiny fabrics, tight skirts and high heels. Here are a couple of examples from the archive. Both have a very typical asymmetric detail and both are made from a shiny satin type fabric. The belted waist on the right emphasises the dolman sleeves or bat wings. The green dress dates to 1987 and the Black and white dress is from 1986. Another huge influence on 1980s fashion was Princess Diana. In 1981, we said, Romance is in the air for St. Michael Lady's spring fashions. Blouses will continue to follow their romantic theme with frills and ruffles, both at the neck and cuffs. Although by 1982, we were warning that ruffles are being upstaged by lacy collars. And here are some garments from the archive demonstrating these frills and ruffles. The dress on the left is made from a fabric with a permanent micro pleat. Both these dresses date to the end of 1982. In a 1981 staff magazine, we said, the Princess of Wales has captured the country's imagination with her own individual style of dress. So great has been her influence on fashion that most women in the country probably own at least one blouse or dress trimmed with ruffles or lace. In the 1990s, we started to see a move towards much more minimal styles and particularly towards the end of the decade, a more neutral color palette. Draped flowing styles, bias cut and figure hugging dresses were all popular at m and during the 1990s. Column dresses and slip dresses, often with spaghetti straps, epitomise the minimalist trend and silky or sparkly versions were often worn as formal wear. These images are from 1998 and 1996 on the right hand side. We can take a closer look at some garments in the archive from the 1990s. So these dresses all date to around 1998. The dress on the left was part of a range of garments knitted using Italian yarn. In 1998, we employed designer Julia MacDonald to advise on our latest collection of knitwear, which included dresses. MacDonald was working with Karl Lagerfeld at Chanel at the time and was known for his innovative use of knitwear in creating these figure hugging sheer garments with intricate designs. His style, I think, can be seen clearly in the black dress in the centre. I wanted to bring things a little bit more up to date now, and the archive is a rich source of inspiration for m and designers today, who regularly consult vintage garments to inspire current collections. I wanted to share a couple of examples of this with you. So the print on this 1940s utility apron on the left was recolored for a range of dresses and blouses in 2020. The colors in the apron are very typical of a lot of the 1940s garments that we have in the collection. And it's really interesting to see how that print has been interpreted and reworked for the customer of 2020. And in 2016, the model and designer Alexa Chung selected her favorite pieces from the archive for the archive by Alexa collection. This blue and white spotted 1960s dress on the left was replicated for the collection and it's almost a carbon copy of the original that was then resold in 2016. And I think that shows that vintage styles are often timeless. That brings us to the end of our talk today. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
If you have any questions or if you'd like to get in touch, our email address is company.archive at marksandspencer.com or you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at M and S Heritage.